Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We'll uh, confine all questions about Richard Sherman until after the briefing. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we've got some weather coming into Washington, so it's great to have such a, a, an excellent turnout. Um, this is obviously a very timely briefing, and we'll get right to it. Um, I'm joined here by my colleagues from the Russia Eurasia program, Andy Cutchins, Dr. Andrew Cutchins, who is our uh, Russia Eurasia program director, and Jeff, Dr. Jeff Mankoff, who is his deputy. Um, I'm also joined by uh, the Honorable Juan Cesarati. Uh, Juan, uh, of course, was Deputy National Security Advisor during the Bush administration, is a senior advisor here at CSIS, and our key person um, on counterterrorism and many other issues. So with that, I'd like to uh, offer uh, Andrew Cutchins the microphone, and we'll get started. We'll have some brief remarks to open up um, and by our principals here, and then we will uh, open it up to your questions. Thank you for coming. Well, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, as Andrew said, I think we're all glad you, you braved the rumor of a snowflake in Washington, D.C. later today to come here this morning. You know, it's always a good thing before doing a press briefing to uh, just check the news. And uh, so I checked uh, the Moscow Times, and the title of the story was Potential Suicide Bomber Reported in Sochi. Now, you guys have already probably heard about this story. There's two parts. First of all, there's this uh, video that was produced by, supposedly by the Dagestan Vilyat, uh, which is an, uh, a, a part of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Caucasus Emirate, uh, headed by the maybe alive, maybe dead Doku Umarov. Um, <clears throat> and they, uh, supposedly, this is, a, this is a video of the two suicide bombers who uh, took out, conducted the acts in Volgograd. Um, maybe I don't know. I watch the video. You look at you look and you look, but you look at these guys, and I can't. They look a little bit like Wayne and Garth in a uh, uh, Saturday Night Live skit, and I do wonder whether some of this is uh, is a hoax uh, conducted by by folks. Imagine yourself in a dorm room in a university. This could be a. Um, I don't want to take this lightly at all, but I, when I look at this, this is the sort of the first thought I had. And then the story of the of the of the suicide bomber uh, Rustana Ibrahimova, um, who's supposedly been spotted uh, in in Sochi, uh, reported by Alexander Valov, the head of blog Sochi. Um, you know what's. What's the, uh, how serious this is, uh, it's hard for me to, to say, but when you read the story, you really kind of scr have to scratch your head. It says, it was unclear whether Ibrahimova was carrying any explosives with her. It was also not immediately clear how a suspected terrorist who was supposedly interrogated by law enforcement officials in the past could get into Russia's Olympic capital and heightened security. Uh, she was, uh, uh, Valov published a, a copy of the official letter sent by the local FSB to the Krasnodar Anti-Extremism Center, asking them to chase the subject. That's a good idea. Uh, who arrived in Sochi on January 10th or 11th. The letter describes Ibrahimova as someone who limps, quote, limps slightly, her elbow does not bend, and she has a 10 centimeter long scar on her left cheek. Um, how she got past the, the security uh, does make one wonder whether, again, actually, is this really true? Is, or could this be a hoax? Uh, and if it's not a hoax, then you know, how could someone who obviously looks like a, an extremist Shahidka, actually is an extremist Shahidka, has been interrogated and identified as an extremist Shahidka, could get through, could get through security? Um, it doesn't give one uh, one great great confidence. Uh, anyway, we can talk more more about that later. But it is unusual. Uh, these games are unusual. I mean, how many times has CSIS actually held a press conference before an Olympic Games? Uh, my suspicion is never, um, and that's uh, a hint that these are. Uh, <coughs> and it's a press conference in which actually uh, heads of major news organizations actually showed up. So this is a rather unusual event. <laughs> 
Let me start by saying these games are very, very personal, I think, for Vladimir Putin. Uh, I mean, has any Winter Olympic Games uh, in history been so identified or attached to a national leader as these games are to Mr. Putin? I mean, in 2010, was anybody talking about Stephen Harper much when the games were in Vancouver? Uh, or George W. Bush in 2002 in Park, in Park City? Actually, ironically, the Park City Games, if they gave any political, uh, if they were politicized for anybody, they were a, a boost to Mitt Romney, um, uh, who was uh, running the games at the time. But this is pretty unusual. Now, you, you probably have to go back to the 1936 Summer Games uh, in Berlin, uh, Hitler's Games, the Nazi Games, uh, to have a games that are attached, that are so politicized in a way. I don't mean in any, any respect to you know, compare Vladimir Putin to to, uh, to Adolf Hitler uh, or you know, current Russia to Nazi Germany, but it's just a comment in that the nature of these games, those might have been games where you would have had a press conference at CSIS if at times CSIS it, it existed. Um, so why? Well, you know, I think it goes back to, first of all, when Putin personally went to Guatemala City and ironically on July 4th, 2007, and he gave a very uh, convincing uh, and impassioned speak to the Olympic Committee uh, to award the games uh, over the other three finalists at the at the time uh, in Austria and South Korea, and uh, and he convinced the committee to award the games to to Russia. Now, um, and for Putin, he says he said this on numer numerous occasions that he looks upon you know holding an Olympic games, you have to be a country that actually that I mean to put it uh, in. Uh, layman's terms, you really, it has its act together. You know, you have to be a major country. This is not a small undertaking to put on an Olympic, an Olympic Games. And so this is represents, you know, this is not Russia of the 1990s uh, that was, you know, the wild, wild east, uh, you know, where we had the images of the Russian mafia basically running the, running the country to the extent that it could be, could be run or organized crime, or actually I, call, I refer to it as disorganized crime. No, this is Vladimir Putin's Russia in which he has restored a sense of order and stability to the country, and the country is suddenly finding itself much more wealthy than it, than it was. So um, <clears throat> the timing. Now, in 2007, this is after, literally, Russia became financially sovereign. 2005, Russia pays off its, its, uh, its debt to uh, the IMF. In 2000, early in, actually, in 2006, it pays off its debt to the, the Paris Club. So Russia is financially sovereign, which means in Putin's mind, and I think appropriately so, that Russia is politically sovereign. We are actually a real independent country again. Um, and so the, the timing that he can go then go down to Guatemala, Guatemala City and do this is significant. Remember, it was 2006 that Russia held for the first time the, uh, the G8 meeting uh, in uh, St. Petersburg. Now, I should have thought at the time that, hmm, 2014, probably if you know, Russia is hosting those Sochi games, that should have been a big hint that probably Vladimir Putin was going to be running Russia in 2014. I didn't quite put that together at the time, but <clears throat> I should have. And so thinking into the future, I would think, well, Russia has also won the 2018 World Cup, uh, FIFA World Cup. Now, that's going to be after the 2018 presidential election. So my bet is that Vladimir Putin will also be presiding over the, uh, the FIFA World Cup uh, in 2018, uh, assuming things go well uh, here in 2014. Now, why are the games unique as well? Well, first of all, there's lo the location. For Putin, this is very personal as well. He spends a lot of time down in Sochi. Uh, in the context of the Valdai Discussion Club, uh, a group that uh, Jeff and I have met uh, annually with, uh, uh, with uh, Mr. Putin and other Russian leaders. Several times we've gone down to Sochi to meet him at his uh, <clears throat> nice spread down there, shall we say. Um, you know, and Sochi, well, it's kind of like a Russian California. You know, you can swim in the sea in the morning and then you can go up the mountains and they're only 45 minutes away. You don't have to drive three and a half hours, four hours, or if you're in traffic, like six hours to Tahoe, and you can ski. You've got this sort of very unique uh, combination, and uh, I, it's kind of bizarre that Russia, a country that's known for being a, a northern country, is hosting the Winter Olympics in a subtropical climate. Uh, 
go figure. But the really significant thing about Sochi's uh, geography, obviously, is its proximity to the Northern Caucasus. And this is also a very, very personal issue for Vladimir Putin. I mean, his rise to political uh, stardom uh, in Russia to the national caliber took place when he was initially prime minister in the fall of 1999 uh, when <coughs> the uh, when the second Chechen war started and the first Chechen war of course was a representation of the humiliation of Russia where Russia effectively lost a civil war on its own territory Russian troops performed miserably uh, in the second war and particularly in the beginning uh, Russian military forces, other security forces performed uh, better than they, than they had, and the, the perceived success of those early strikes on the uh, <coughs> terrorists and opposition in the Second Chechen War were a big boost for Putin's pop popularity. Um, and it was where Putin also uh, kind of bonded with the Russian people, with his, you know, uh, his kind of macho way of being. You know, he said famously, I'm going to <coughs> wipe them out in the outhouses. M you know, well, you know what? Okay, guess what? You know, Russia, you got to get to get the vernacular. Uh, actually, what Putin was saying, because Russia is a rich, Russian is a rich language, and it's also a very rich language of uh, four-letter words. Or in Russia, as they call it, mat. It's tied to the word mother. You, see, you hear what I'm saying? So think of what you said. It was basically, I'm going to... F them up in the blank houses or in the speepers, okay? I mean, really, that's the, what he was saying, okay? It's much more kind of earthy and down to, that, yeah, I'm going to mess these dudes up. Uh, <clears throat> and he saw this as part of his mission, uh, that he was going to, uh, to deal with the separatists and later terrorist groups uh, with this threat in the Northern Caucasus, for initially in Chechnya, and because he saw it as a, literally as a mortal threat to the uh, to the Russian to the Russian nation, and so the biggest his mo is he brought stability, and the fact that hopefully in Olympic Games, for the first time in history, could be held in such clock, close proximity to a conflict zone. Now it's a relatively low level you know insurgency going on in much of the Northern Caucasus today. Again, is a totally unique aspect about these Olympic Games, and it's why. We're having this press conference, press conference here, and if you can successfully hold these these games next to this area, which Putin saw as his mission as Russia's leader to bring stability to, then yes, he's been he's been successful. So he's got a lot he's got a lot riding on it. Um, just a quick word about the uh, <coughs> the uh, the controversy over uh, the LGBT. Uh, legislation, which has attracted uh, so much controversy, the law and propaganda against uh, pedophiles and homosexuality. Um, you know, you know, many have asked the question: well, Why in the world, why would Putin and the Russians, you know, you know, implement this piece of legislation when <clears throat> on the eve of this big international event, when they know it's going to attract a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, negative attention and press? Well, you know what? The legislation, in my view, is not really addressed to the international community. Putin doesn't really care, frankly, about what the international community thinks about this. Although, in his press conference, you know, he will talk, he will defend it in kind of comparative terms that, you know, look, actually, our legislation, you know, is is uh, quite liberal when you compare it with most of the rest of the world, et cetera, et cetera. It's aimed at a domestic audience, and it's it's done for domestic political reasons, I think, to support his constituency. <coughs> now. Um, let me say a quick word finally about the, the terrorist, which that would be a good segue over to Juan because I'm going on too long. The, look, the terrorist threat is very real. I mean, regardless of you know what is true or not true about this video uh, and uh, Rustama Ibrahimova, uh, et cetera, and, um, and obviously the uh, the tragic terrorist acts in Volgograd that took place a few weeks ago at the end of 20, 2013 attest to that. But I think what we're talking about right now really aren't separatists, okay? Even though Doku Umarov uh, is head of the Caucasus Emirate, which in principle talks about, you know, establishing a separate Islamic state in the Caucasus, that's not really the ideology that motivates, I think, these people at this point. I think they're motivated by a global jihadist ideology, uh, which is, uh, you know, common to that of uh, uh, Al-Qaeda 
uh, and others around the world. Uh, this is what motivated the Sarnayev brothers uh, in, who bombed the Boston Marathon, who were also from uh, Dagestan in the Northern Caucasus <coughs> in uh, 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 last, last year. Now, now Doku Umarov himself, he may have been a Chechen nationalist 15 to 20 years ago, but again, if he's still alive, he utilizes a global jihadist ideology. Uh, this is what you'll see, you know, in uh, in his in what what he said, particularly what he had, it goes back to in July 13th, threatening the games and and with other subgroups that are kind of affiliated loosely with the the uh, the Emirate, this loose network. Um, so, with all that, you know, Putin's got a lot riding on the games, and you know, Sochi is the holy grail, I would think, for for a terrorist, uh, Islamic jihadist, uh, terrorist uh, individual or group to go after. Um, and uh, so in a way, we have kind of the ultimate showdown. Um, because for Putin's got a lot of writing on it. This is a very juicy target. You know, in this is sort of in American vernacular, it's high noon at the OK Corral. In Russian terms, it's kto kavo, you know, who's going to get whom, or, you know, in Spanish terms, that this is mano a mano, uh, or you know, in NFL football, this is you know Richard Sherman versus Michael Crabtree last Sunday, right? You know who's gonna who's gonna prevail? Um, the question, though, and this is where I leave it uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to Juan, who really knows uh, something about uh, these groups and individuals, is one of operational uh, capabilities. I mean, Sochi is supposedly under lockdown. Although you read a story like this, you go, really? <laughs> Um, you know, but you don't necessarily have to hit Sochi to spoil the games. And this is my concern when I, uh, my response to the Volgograd bombings uh, a few weeks ago. You know, a series of Volgograd caliber attacks would virtually terrorize all of Russia and uh, and spoil the games, and uh, that would be a, uh, a, a a great tragedy. Finally, just a word about Umarov. Is he dead? Uh, I'm kind of skeptical about about that. I mean, the reportings of uh, uh, Mr. Umarov's death uh, have been many in the past. And one would think in particular that if he were taken out by the FSB, the Russian authorities, you know, they would want to, you know, show the video of his dead body um, to, uh, to bring greater uh, uh, sense of calm uh, about the games themselves. But, you know, whether he's dead or not, I'm not sure how much that would make actually make a difference. In that, I don't think that Umarov is as as, as much sort of operational uh, capacity as let's say Shamil Basayev did ten years ago. Um, and the network is so loose itself that maybe the absence of his leadership would leave others possibly okay competing to uh, to carry out or have be able to claim uh, uh, taking the responsibility for carrying out um, uh, the act which uh, would gather all of the attention. But, uh, you know, let's all pray that that doesn't happen. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, for any difficult questions, uh, my colleague Jeff Mankoff will address them. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And um, we've had an interesting confluence events of events in D.C. today. We have uh, DC school DC schools are closed. Virginia and Maryland schools are closed. So, I think our children all, when they were flipping back and forth between SpongeBob this morning, uh, learned how to curse in Russian. So this is great. Um, thank you for that, uh, Juan. Uh, I'll leave it with you. Thanks, Andrew. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you all for attending, Andy. It's great to be here. I think part of the reason you get great attendance is because uh, CSIS has great expertise in you and your your team. So, uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, what I wanted to address was um, more specifically the, the terrorist threats and to give you some perspective. In particular, from my vantage point, when I sat at the White House and at the Treasury Department, when we worried about security of every Olympic Games post 9-11, uh, because the reality is uh, the, the security of the Olympics, whether they're in the United States or in London or in Athens or in Sochi, uh, become a principal concern for uh, policymakers around the world. because. The Olympics become such a target-rich environment for terrorist groups, including those that have designs not just globally, but perhaps locally and regionally. And I think the security concerns with respect to Sochi are uh, even greater and even uh, more justified uh, in this regard. Um, and let me explain why. Uh, 
the terrorist groups uh, led by the Caucasus Emirates, but not solely, uh, and their affiliates, uh, but also Central Asian groups like IMU and IJU, um, have the clear intent to try to disrupt uh, the Sochi Olympics, or at least to embarrass the Russians, uh, and in particular Vladimir Putin, who has so personalized uh, the Olympics and the success of them, as Andy has described. Uh, the intent has been declared. Uh, Doku Umarov uh, this past summer has been very clear about the desire uh, to have major attacks on the Olympics, or at least major disruptions. Uh, significantly in July, uh, he lifted uh, the putative ban on the attacks on civilians, which in many ways opens up the target set for terrorist groups to attack softer targets, transportation hubs, uh, civilian sites. Uh, and they clearly have the desire uh, to engage in these attacks, um, as uh, seen through their video postings, their blogs, uh, and their communications. And so the intent is clear and it's there, and it would have been obvious even absent uh, their open declarations, but the open declarations have really uh, made it very clear for authorities. They also have the capability. Uh, we've seen that with the three attacks in Volgograd since September. Uh, we've seen this in their past attacks, in particular those uh, directed by uh, Umarov uh, since 2009, uh, the high-speed attack uh, between Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, the airport attack, uh, and other attacks that have um, predated. Um, what's interesting and important here is that uh, the Caucasus Emirates and their various groups and operatives have demonstrated multiple modalities uh, in terms of attack vectors. That is to say, they can use a variety of means to attack, not just a variety of targets to focus on. And so uh, they've used uh, suicide bombers uh, to include the now famed Black Widows, uh, they've used teams of operatives, they've used assault uh, teams, they've uh, vectored against uh, uh, airplanes and, and metros and trains, uh, hospitals, uh, security sites. And so the modalities and capabilities sort of match here in that they have a target-rich environment uh, and they've demonstrated the ability to organize different types of attacks based on the opportunities available to them. Uh, and that's why the reports of a singular uh, Black Widow uh, getting into Sochi becomes concerning, in part because you have the potential that she's a, a singular actor intended to disrupt, but it also could be that she's a part of a broader uh, series of suicide bombers who've been um, dispatched uh, to attack different sites. And so no doubt the Russians are following not just reports of, of a singular actor, but multiple threat threads and, and individuals that they're concerned with. Lastly, they have the opportunity. Um, the Olympics, as we all know, is center stage. Uh, uh, the world's media will be trained on uh, the Olympics, uh, both the, the activities, the social activities around it. Um, uh, in addition, you have the proximity, uh, rather brazen on the part of Putin, in a sense, to, to place uh, the Olympics so close to the, the Caucasus and to give uh, the terrorist actors who are used to operating in this environment the opportunity uh, to plan attacks, uh, not just in Sochi, but in the immediate environs. Uh, and as Andy rightly said, um, the terrorists in this context, uh, for the purposes of disruption and embarrassment, don't necessarily have to get into the inner rings of security within Sochi to uh, have a declared successful attack. Uh, they need only create a sense of terror or disruption uh, in the immediate environs, or even in the transportation hubs, as, as we've seen with Volgograd, uh, to create a sense of instability. Uh, and I would dare say if you saw a successful attack, significant enough, uh, even in the, um, in the far abroad from Sochi, for example, in Moscow, you would begin to see debates uh, in um, delegation circles as to whether or not to withdraw athletes and to uh, stop participation in the Olympics. And that would be uh, disastrous uh, for the success of the Olympics. Um, a final point in terms of why this threat is, uh, is so unique at this time, and I think it's, it has gone uh, relatively unreported, but I think it's critically important as an accelerant to the threat. Uh, and that is the fact that, uh, as Andy said, we are talking about a, a movement and a set of actors who view themselves as part of a global jihadi movement. And so this, in many ways, is born out of the Chechen conflicts and insurgencies of the, of the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, but these groups have been animated and populated by global jihadi actors, uh, many of whom have interacted with uh, um, the, the leadership of the Caucasus Emirates, 
uh, many of whom have gone on to fight, uh, including now in places like Syria. And I think it's critically important to keep in mind that the Russians have taken a very open and active role diplomatically in supporting Assad, uh, which has brought Russia back into the center as a uh, far enemy for the global jihadi movement. And you've begun to see that narrative uh, play out in some of the uh, terrorist uh, discourse. Um, and I think that becomes important as an accelerant because Russia is not just uh, an actor in, in regard to the Chechen or Dagestani or Ingushet uh, insurgency or fight, but is also a global actor in the context of um, uh, the global jihadi narrative. Uh, and Syria, in many ways, is a key accelerant to that, both in real terms and in ideological terms. What are the concerns for the U.S. in this regard? And I think you've started to hear more and more uh, about this uh, from U.S. lawmakers and, and uh, security officials. Uh, but they're threefold. First, the, the obvious fact that you have a real terrorist threat here. Uh, these aren't just uh, imaginings uh, or you know, sort of uh, you know, one-off uh, threat threads that have to be uh, chased down as often the U.S. has to do. Uh, but this is a real terrorist threat that exposes athletes, sponsors, uh, uh, U.S. citizens that are going to attend the event. Two, you always have the question of venue security, and Andy's raised a very good question as to how secure actually are the rings of security around uh, the Sochi, Sochi venues and uh, sites. Um, but how well are they secured? Um, you can secure the venue, but have you secured well enough where the athletes and sponsors are staying? Uh, if you've secured that, have you secured well enough the ingress and egress? Uh, the transportation in and out. Uh, and so the, the raw security questions uh, emerge as very important questions. Um, and there's, there's growing, a growing sense of lack of confidence in that security, e even uh, despite the Russian uh, assurances. Um, and lastly, and perhaps most importantly, you've started to hear, including from Chairman Rogers of the House Intel uh, Committee, concerns over lack of visibility and cooperation from the Russians. Um, as I was mentioning to Jill before uh, we started the remarks, usually what you have in the Olympics is most countries very prideful wanting to uh, secure the Olympics, manage it uh, themselves, and to, to succeed for national pride and, and, and other reasons, uh, with the U.S. offering support and help in a variety of ways. Uh, most countries don't accept the support initially because they can do it themselves. Uh, but as you get closer to the, the day of the event, most countries begin to accept more and more of the assistance because the reality of the, of the daunting task of securing the Olympics and frankly of the threat to uh, Western athletes and, and sponsors becomes more real. Um, that I don't think is happening in the Russian context. In fact, I think the reverse is happening, that the Russians have grown more and more concerned over the threat um, and are concerned over the perception of insecurity and therefore have not wanted to allow the United States and other uh, security services in on the ground to assist. Uh, in, a, in an Olympics like London, uh, as you can imagine, the uh, U.S. worked very closely with British uh, security officials uh, to create cohesive command centers, uh, response plans, etc. That, in my estimation, is not happening uh, in the context of Sochi, and that has created concern, is why I think you've started to hear U.S. officials speak openly about those concerns. In addition, that's why I think you've started to see reports today in the press about contingency plans that the U.S. is making uh, for a uh, potential worst-case scenario, uh, transport aircraft being pre-positioned, uh, naval aircraft, uh, naval um, resources and warships being uh, placed offshore uh, in the worst-case scenario if, for example, you had wounded uh, uh, athletes or citizens you needed to uh, get them out. Um, and so you're going to see a lot more of that where the U.S. is is trying to vector and take into account the fact that we don't have on the ground cooperation resources as we have in the past. Now, very quickly, the challenges for the Russians uh, and for the international community, uh, because I think this is not, you know, the, any Olympics is, um, is an international event, despite the fact that it's been so personalized by Putin and, and, and the Russians. Um, but the Russians have to not only uh, secure the sites as they're trying to do with uh, physical security and intelligence and, and vetting of individuals, but they are going to want to uh, disrupt as much as possible any terrorist activity abroad. And this is why you've seen the reports of the death of Doku Umarov. I think the, the, 
regardless of whether or not it's true, it's, it's a, an attempt to demonstrate that the Russians are doing something to try to disrupt these activities. Uh, and I agree with Andy uh, that with respect to the individual, I think it matters much less uh, as to whether or not he's alive now with respect to the Security Olympics, uh, because uh, I think all the terrorist groups that want to attack the Sochi Olympics know that they want to attack the Sochi Olympics and will try to do so. Um, they obviously need to secure the site. And they need to worry about the perception of security. I think this, this is key because, again, uh, you could have a relatively minor terrorist attack uh, you know, during the opening ceremonies or something in, in the general environs, and it begins to affect the sense of security for the Olympics. Uh, and in many ways, the terrorists begin to, uh, to win in terms of that perception. A quick final note uh, that we often forget, but is um, squarely in the minds of security officials. You have not just the Winter Olympics in February, but you have the Paralympics in March. And so you have two sets of uh, events that are uh, critical internationally uh, that require the Russians to engage in security, not just in the month of February, but February through March. Um, and I would dare say that the terrorists probably um, would prefer to attack the Sochi Olympics in February, but if they could uh, launch sig significant and serious attacks against the Paralympics or those environs around it, uh, they would probably view that as successful. So this is a two-month uh, endeavor for the Russians uh, that is going to be fraught with real threats and real concerns for the Russians, the U.S., and uh, others who have Olympians uh, at the site. Thank you. Great. And with that, we'd, uh, with that, we'd like to open it up to your questions. Questions, please? Jill. Thank you. Um, uh, James, I'd, I'd like to ask to follow up on that U.S. side of it. Um, what does the United States do? What, to your knowledge, what is the state of play in terms of any type of cooperation uh, in potentially coming in and getting Americans out of there, either people who are competing or tourists or officials? And um, what does the U.S. do if they do not have permission on the ground? What, what are the, let's say, how do they work that out in advance? You were mentioning that. Yeah. What, what's the next step for the United States? What's happening right now? Well, ideally in, uh, in the Olympics, what you would have is, um, you know, State Department diplomatic security officials, FBI, uh, and other U.S. security officials who are cleared in uh, to the various venues or cleared in to a command center or in some way integrated into the on-the-ground security. Um, I'm no longer in government, so I don't know what the status of that is, but I would dare say, given the public comments that we've seen, uh, that the U.S. government probably is not getting a lot of billets, so to speak, a lot of uh, clearances for individuals uh, from the State Department, from the FBI and others to be on the ground at particular sites. Um, now, that's different from security for individual teams and such, but uh, I, would, I would venture to say that uh, we're doing the best with what we can on the ground. Uh, and what you've seen and you started to see publicly is contingency planning, uh, which would be led by the State Department to try to determine uh, what happens in the worst case scenario. And that's why you've seen the reports of movement of uh, U U.S. military um, assets and personnel uh, in this regard. Um, and so you would have, uh, you know, the State Department leading that planning, trying to determine, uh, you know, how best to get uh, citizens in and out in case of an emergency. Um, and you would hopefully have uh, pre-cleared plans and uh, clearances for ingress and egress in the, the case of uh, an attack uh, in Russia. But I would, I would assume that the Russians are going to want to control any of that. Uh, any security service in any country is going to want to have uh, full capability and control over what happens after uh, a, a, an attack or a worst case scenario. Uh, and so it's, it's likely the case that the U.S. doesn't have pre-clearance to you know, move choppers in or assets in in the event of an emergency. That's probably going to have to happen as um, events unfold. Uh, this gentleman, if you could identify yourself uh, in the microphone, that'd be great.
I, I think it, the Syrian uh, foreign fighter problem, uh, and in particular the flow of uh, Caucasus-based fighters uh, in and out of Syria, uh, amplifies the concern, I think. Um, and part of this is, again, the, the ideological and narrative dimensions of, of uh, what this does to animate uh, the threat, uh, but also uh, populates uh, sort of the environment with other actors who are trained, tested, uh, and perhaps willing to attack. Keep in mind that the Syrian conflict has now attracted more fi foreign fighters than we saw in the Iraq uh, conflict. Um, and uh, more than what we saw during the Afghan Mujahideen days. And so this is a very serious threat, and you've seen plenty of reporting of Western European services, uh, North African uh, services, Gulf services, very concerned about the flows of fighters in and out of Syria. Uh, and the one thing I would say is uh, concern that officials should have, at least, is that the survival rate appears to be much higher in the Syrian foreign fighter context. Whereas in Iraq, what we saw was foreign fighters would flow in, but they wouldn't flow out. Um, that's not necessarily the case here in Syria, where you have foreign fighters already starting to flow back. And what that means for the Russian service's ability to monitor who's moving in and out of Syria, uh, I don't know. But it's certainly something they should be concerned about. Just to follow up on that, there are reports of, uh, of hundreds of uh, uh, foreign fighters from the North Caucasus in Syria it, itself. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's no, how many actually are there, it's, it's impos impossible to say, but there are many there. Uh, and this is one really big reason, and I think it's been underestimated over the past two plus years for why Putin's held this position on Syria as he has. Because when he looks at the, when he looks at, you know, who are the most effective uh, you know, fighters in Syria, he sees uh, the same kinds of individuals in groups, sometimes literally the same individuals in groups that he's been dealing with in the North Caucasus, uh, or that uh, uh, he and his uh, Central Asian colleagues were dealing with uh, back in the late 1990s, in particular, coming out of Af out of Afghanistan, and that is in particular why this is the issue is deeply, deeply personal for him. Um, and there's some, I think if the, if the, uh, if the Syrian conflict uh, had uh, receded uh, and foreign fighters were leaving uh, Syria, I think there's no doubt, in my mind at least, that that would increase the danger that uh, uh, those from the North Caucasus or others, maybe even not from the North Caucasus, would, would, would return there and increase the threat, increase the threat uh, uh, the threat there. A friend of mine uh, was uh, a month or two ago at the airport in Istanbul transferring, and uh, he heard Russian spoken by people who clearly looked like what you would imagine a uh, uh, a foreign fighter in Syria to uh, to look like, and it was rather unnerving since uh, he himself at the time was was uh, transiting uh, into the, uh, not the Northern Caucasus, but the South Caucasus. Uh, Bill Douglas, right over here. Jeff? <laughs> Thanks. Um, and, well, Putin, Putin uh, in his press conference uh, just the other day, uh, you know, noted that uh, no, Russia has not had the experience of securing an event of the magnitude of the Sochi Olympics. Um, so the answer is, uh, is no. Uh, I mean, you'd have to go back to the Moscow Olympics in 1980. Uh, uh, you know, for a, I think, uh, an international event of this magnitude, uh, which the quote unquote Russians had to, had to deal with. And of course, that was in the context of just having invaded, attacked, 
Afghanistan, and uh, uh, which of course led to the uh, essentially the creation of the Mujahideen and uh, much of the problem that we see here today. So the simple answer is no. Um, you know, Juan can speak to this much more effectively, I think, that you know, we never know the, the number of uh, successes in preventing terrorist attacks. We only know about the failures. Uh, but simply the fact that uh, we saw significant failures in uh, Volgograd uh, three times uh, in the recent, uh, uh, the end of last year, October and two in December. Uh, Piatigorsk, even closer to, uh, uh, to Sochi, also at the end of, end of the year. And the, you know, the, the daily uh, uh, bombings and problems that there are in, uh, in the North Caucasus. Now, it's not at the, the frequency of what we're seeing in Iraq right now. We're listening to the radio, and there are 25 car bombings a day, uh, approximately. But um, uh, so magnitude, uh, for sure, is a no. The, the capacity of the, of the FSB is very, very hard, hard to say. But um, I think to get back to uh, Juan's point earlier, you know, the fact that the Russians have been reluctant to uh, embrace support from the United States, I think partly out of reasons of, you know, intelligence cooperation is a very, very delicate matter in the best of times. Uh, we had pretty effective intelligence cooperation with the Russians after 9-11. In fact, I think at that time the Russians were probably providing us, as I've heard, you know, more high-quality operational intelligence than we were able to provide them. But, uh, you know, we know that the relationship and the level of trust between the two countries has deteriorated significantly since then. Um, and that's, that's a problem for sure. And then there is the sort of, the sort of, uh, the nature of the, the Russian kind of psychology, and it's not just Rus the Russian psychology, but maybe more so that, you know, like we can do this on our own and we don't need your help. And, for, and then for Putin, you know, this is a, such a sore spot because it's like we did not recognize, in his view, soon enough, and I think he's got a legitimate beef about this, that the, the nature of the threat, uh, even in the mid-90s, in the first Chechen war, when it was mostly a movement of national li liberation, there was a significant, you know, foreign element there. Fighters, also sources of financing and training and training for them. That factor was much more significant in the Second Chechen War, uh, and it really rankles him deeply, deeply, that uh, this was not adequately, uh, adequately recognized. And uh, uh, and this is a harping on the double standards that only accentuates, I think, some of the. The, uh, the chip on the shoulder, so to, so to speak, about, about this forum. Now, I think the, the State Department uh, did a very smart thing uh, in a few years ago in actually putting Doku Umarov and the Caucasus Emirate you know, on the list of recognized terrorist groups and individuals. But uh, you know, uh, some would say in Russia that was too late, too little, and, and, and too late. And finally, uh, you know, we have to look at, you know, what happened, uh, you know, with the Sarnayev brothers. Uh, you know, the fact that, you know, there was inadequate, inadequate uh, communication between U.S. and Russian intelligence services uh, tracking and following these guys. Um, and when the, uh, uh, the elder brother had gone to Dagestan, uh, which is really not now the heart uh, the heart of the uh, uh, the sort of Islamic uh, threat region in the North Caucasus for six or seven months. You know, how effectively were they track? Were they were they tracking him? We just we just don't know, and uh, not knowing doesn't you know lead to increased confidence. So Uh, my 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 suspicion that it, it's both. Jeff, did you want to? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I would just add two things on this on this topic. One, and you've heard a lot of discussion of this in the Russian press recently, in terms of the capacity of the security services. They're essentially structured differently from the way that security services in the West are structured. Their main goal is regime security rather than public security, let's say. Um, and obviously, with a high profile, very politically significant event like the Olympics, those two things are connected. But nevertheless, I think the, the goal of the, the security state um, that Putin presides over, and indeed out of which Putin himself came, is very much directed more at insulating the regime from pressures coming from outside rather than it is towards securing the public in general. And I think one of the challenges that that apparatus faces in the context of the Olympics is trying to make that pivot to do more of a public security role precisely because of the political importance that it has. And I don't know um, about their capacity to do that. The second point that I would just emphasize here, and this is something that we haven't talked about, but I think it's really um, important in a lot of contexts related to the Olympics is corruption. Um, the the discussion in Russia has um, a lot of in the lead up to the games has really focused on this element on the amount of money that's been uh, misappropriated, misplaced, um, gone into dodgy contracts and offshore bank accounts. Um, by almost all accounts, these are going to be the most expensive Olympic games ever, um, upwards of fifty billion dollars. Um, as much of a third of that may have just simply been embezzled or stolen. Now, what does this all have to do with security? Well, I think operationally the security services can be supremely effective, but they're only in the macro sense as effective as their weakest link. And in a lot of cases, the weakest link is corruption. Um, if you think about uh, some of the successful attacks that have been carried out uh, in Russia over the last decade or so, um, one that really in, um, is, is really striking, I guess, is the um, when two female Chechen suicide bombers blew up uh, Russian aircraft in about, I want to say 2007 or so, I don't remember exactly. 2004. 2004. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and essentially what happened um, was these women bribed their way through security checkpoints. Uh, they bribed the, uh, the guards at the airport to let them onto the planes, even though you know, they, didn't, they hadn't gone through the proper procedures, they weren't searched, um, and then they detonated suicide bombs when they were uh, on board. Um, so you know, the system can be set up in a way that's designed to focus on these kind of threats, but it only takes one person, one you know, corrupt guard who's willing to look the other way in exchange for a bribe of one kind or another to uh, have the entire thing come apart and for a successful attack to be pulled off. And I think that's one of the, the real unknowns as we think about how secure the, the Olympics are going to be. That's a very important point. And, and just note that one of the, the planes that was targeted um, in that 2004 attack was headed to Sochi, um, interestingly. Um, the one thing I would say about the Russian security services is they are ruthless and effective when they want to be. Um, and if you look at the history of U.S. designations of individuals, uh, terrorists from the Caucasus regions or, or otherwise, um, most of those individuals end up dead because the Russians kill them. So the Russians um, can be ruthless and effective when they want to be. There are huge limitations, uh, and I think they're going to be challenged here. I'm Fatima Tliso, Voice of America Russian Service. My question is uh, to anybody who takes it. Uh, in their latest statement, the Dagestani Ansar Alsuna um, took responsibility for Volgograd, but also they threatened to attack Sochi, including chemical weapons. Uh, how serious did this threat can be, in your opinion? Um, is, there, is there any connection to Syria, in your opinion? Thank you. I, I think to Andy's initial point, I think part of this is um, building the perception of insecurity. And so uh, you have to sort of um, modulate one's reaction to anything that, that uh, terrorist groups uh, indicate. But you have to take it seriously, of course. 
Uh, and I know one of the concerns that Russian and U.S. officials have had for a long time is uh, the ability of groups in the Caucasus to get their hands on WMD, uh, whether it's chemical weapons or uh, nuclear components. Uh, and that has been a, a source of great concern for a number of years. I think um, the fact that Syria is a cauldron of conflict and you have chemical weapons available to the actors there uh, certainly heightens that concern. Uh, but I myself have not seen anything in the open source reporting or, or otherwise that would suggest you've had uh, sort of a caravan of chemical weapons moving to, uh, to Sochi uh, for attack. Uh, but it's the kind of thing you have to take very seriously, uh, and no doubt it's something the U.S. authorities are, are looking at in terms of threat vectors. Just as a, as a it's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> although I, I thought you were going to bring up the Circassian question, which is an excellent question also, but uh, I'm sure somebody will subsequently. Uh, you know, it was very striking to me, uh, you know, in the the diametrically opposed uh, responses of uh, U.S. and Russian officials to the uh, August 21st um, uh, chemi brutal chemical weapons attack in uh, in Syria, uh, the largest one uh, that had been uh, it has been uh, perpetrated by 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 a long by a long shot, and um, it puzzled me a lot. And, uh, and in thinking about it, I was trying to think of, well, what could be a, a plausible, uh, you know, case where uh, actually the two sides aren't, aren't fundamentally disagreeing so much. Uh, and the plausible case, I suppose, would be that uh, actually the, you know, the Russian government response that, uh, 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 that the, uh, that the, the Assad forces had no incentive to use chemical weapons since they knew that was the only contingency which would po possibly bring upon a, an American military strike. Uh, you know, there's a logic to that for sure, but uh, there's a, a corollary logic to that as well, I think, that if uh, the opposition somehow uh, could gain control of some chemical weapons uh, in Syria and uh, uh, make it appear as though the um, Assad's forces had carried out that, that strike, uh, there would be a huge incentive for them to do that. Um, uh, because, of course, that would not only bring on the American military strike, but much more significant American and other international support for, for, for them in their fight against the Assad government. And, you know, knowing at the time that uh, before our agreement on uh, the chemical weapons initiative, uh, the, the, the diffusion of chemical weapons sites around Syria, there's so many sites, um, it just seemed that, you know, gosh, uh, you know, it would, only, it would only take, again, you know, one uh, person or one group to get a hold of, you know, one uh, uh, site amongst 40 or maybe even more than 40 that, that existed uh, to be able to have access to the, to the, to the weapons. So I think the, uh, uh, you know, can, all of this only I think is, is supporting what uh, Juan is saying. We have to take this very, very seriously. Uh, and because of the, the trans uh, boundary or transnational nature of the groups and individuals that are fighting in Syria, uh, now, certainly, this is the one issue, and in fact, it was this is the this is the moment in which the U.S.-Russia relationship began to turn around, somewhat uh, last year over the chemical weapons initiative, and subsequently in our talks about uh, the Iranian nuclear weapons nuclear weapons program. But uh, uh, it's whether it is true or not what they are saying. It's certainly clearly something that has to be taken very, very the utmost seriousness. Good morning, Roxana Scott from USA Today. Andrew, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the hoax element of this and whether we might expect to see more sort of reports coming out in the next two weeks before the opening ceremony. And also, what are your expectations for protests um, for human rights, um, anti-gay legislation, that kind of thing, uh, particularly in the zone that they've you know, set up outside the park, far from the park? Um, well, oh, sorry. 
sorry, in my in my opening remarks, I was a bit too flippant. I think maybe, and you know, although there is somewhat of when I look at the picture, I look at the video, it just you know, you, it does make you think that this could be a, a total hoax. You know, someone just having fun, like the like the uh, the intern at KTVU KTVU News in San Francisco, who fed the uh, the report to the teleprompter after the uh, the uh, Asian airliner um, kind of crash landed in San Francisco about the names of the pilots. Uh, that uh, supposedly the first one's name was. Uh, why so low, and et, et cetera, you know, sort of that kind of someone trying someone trying to be funny, but not really not really funny. Um, but I think we're going to see. Uh, I would expect to see more more reports like this for the reasons that that Juan uh, that Juan elaborated, simply to uh, enhance uh, or increase the sense of insecurity around the games. Um, now there have to be, you know, for that to uh, uh, to really be effective. I think that there there do have to be some terrorist attacks. To accompany it, but um, uh, I, I would, I would expect to see more of this uh, uh, in the weeks in the weeks ahead. Uh, and I'm very, I can only say that I'm very, very uh, relieved that at least to this point, uh, we haven't seen any more attacks of the magnitude of what we saw in Volgograd uh, three three weeks ago. Because um, my greatest fear, I think the fear of probably all of us, was that that could be the beginning of you know just a a series of attacks that could take place on a weekly basis or some or even or even more frequently uh, that would uh, uh, effectively destroy the games uh, whether or not Sochi was attacked itself um, the the on the LGBT issue um, you know of course Putin tried to uh, sort of deflect that um, in his press conference, although <laughs> in, in doing so, it it only kind of, I think, probably enraged uh, many in the LGBT community uh, more and, and, their, and their supporters more um, with the way he, you know, look, you're not, you know, no one's going to get thrown, no one's going to get thrown in jail. Uh, this kind of legislation is uh, is actually more liberal than in many other places, and really, what we're only talking about is uh, is is propaganda uh, about this that's being disseminated. But you know, finally, you know, just leave our children alone. <laughs> you know, the effect that he was trying, I think, to uh, uh, to uh, to address the problem, to diffuse the problem. I don't think that was a very effective way of doing it. Shall we? Uh, shall we? Shall we say? And um, uh, all I can say is I hope that the uh, Russian authorities have learned enough from the response they've seen, uh, you know, to the issue over the last few months, that they will handle it with the utmost care and and do their best not to inflame the issue uh, in responding to any. Um, kind of uh, sort of act or you know demonstration or statements that 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 take place, but uh, you know after following Russia so for so long, sometimes I feel that you can never underestimate their capacity to cut their nose off to spite their face. Um, but. Maybe Jeff has something more enlightened to say on this. Well, I don't know. But on this question of hoaxes or uh, threats that may or may not actually be real or that may or may not actually lead to attacks, you know, I think this gets back to the point that Andy made towards the beginning about how these particular games are such an important political project for Putin personally and for the Russian regime more broadly. Um, there's a particular narrative that Putin and the government are trying to get across, and they're using the Olympics in order to um, advance that narrative about how Russia has recovered, about how it's back on its feet, about how they've succeeded in bringing stability not only to Russia, but specifically to the North Caucasus, which has been such a volatile area for the last two decades. And so to the extent that the 
jihadists, the insurgents, the whatever you want to call them, succeed in changing that narrative, succeed in getting the discussion surrounding the Olympics not to be that Russia is back on its feet, that Putin has brought stability, but rather that there's this instability, that there's this insecurity, and that's what everybody is focusing on, then I think it really gets at undercutting that message that the government is trying to get across, regardless of whether there's a successful attack. Obviously, if there is a successful attack, that changes the narrative even more. But even if there's this kind of, you know, low-level um, chatter that basically takes the attention of everybody who's going to Sochi and who's looking at the Olympics off of the, you know, attempts to use this to bolster the prestige of the regime, then in some sense that's a success for, uh, for these insurgents as well. Can I just add, add, add something to that? Um, you know, I think there's, you know, Putin has been very successful, I think, in the eyes of many in his in his foreign policy in the in the in the past the past year. Successful Sochi Olympics kind of kind of kind of accentuates it. It takes the eyes off other issues that are going on inside Russia, because some things that are going on inside Russia are actually quite quite problematic. When you look at, I mean, one of the one of Putin's you know most the most important reason why Putin is popular in Russia is because Russians are living more prosperously than they ever have in their in their history and they experienced this remarkable period of growth uh, from 1998 to 2000 2008 uh, had the dip after the uh, the financial crisis came back to a level of about four percent growth uh, which was okay not uh, where they wanted to be but since Putin has become president Russian economic growth has actually fallen close to zero in 2013 it was 1.3 percent and the last quarter of 2013 it was uh, Close to close to zero, and incomes were falling. So the sense that he has brought prosperity to Russia, you know, you, the 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 Olympics go the Olympics go badly, you know, then, uh, you know, they're disgruntled and people are looking around and, and saying, well, you know, actually, actually, this guy, you know, things aren't going so well economically right now in Russia. If you were to have a, then a, a dip in the in the oil price, which is so important for the performance of the, the, Rus the, Rus the Russian economy, then one can actually start imagining a scenario where uh, his, his leadership is really under much more, much more pressure than, uh, than one would have, would have imagined. So there's also, I think, a sort of a, an element of, you know, have the world focus on the successful Russia. Come to, they're going to come to Russia and see what the new Russia is like. And it's it's completely different from what you, the, what the old Soviet Union was like. You know, this is not you know your father's Buick. This is the the new the new Russia. And you know, this is one reason why they've spent so much money, even if a lot of it has been you know, embezzled or whatnot. Uh, you know, to as a showcase. Um, Just one quick point. The question about protests is a very interesting one, an important one, because um, in planning for the security of any. Uh, a, event, whether it's a G20 meeting or uh, the Olympics, uh, you've got to account for a multiplicity of disruptions or potential disruptions. And so to the extent that there's been planning, I'm assuming that there's planning around everything from uh, dealing with low-level criminality all the way to high-end terrorism. And in between there are disruptions tied to uh, demonstrations or unanticipated gatherings of, of individuals that could be disruptive and could then combine with other threats to, to create a problem. And so your question is a good one because we're f we've been focused on the terrorist threat and the security around that, but uh, any uh, security service that's looking at a, a major event like this is looking at a full suite of potential disruptions and has to be taken into account both uh, singularly and then in combination. Uh, we have time for just uh, a couple more. Yeah, uh, Charlie Erickson with Hispanic Link News Service in Washington, uh, here in Washington. Uh, two, what short of any kind of uh, disruption or attack might cause the United States to withdraw from your uh, perception from the Olympics? And secondly, what do you know about uh, what preparations Mexico and Latin American countries are taking uh, to uh, ensure the safety of their uh, uh, or athletes. You want to do this in Spanish? <laughs> no. um, you know, I, I don't know specifically what the Latin American countries are doing. Um, usually what happens in, in events like this is that you have a reliance on the host country 
uh, to provide the, the adequate security, the communications. Uh, usually most delegations have their own security officers, protocols. The U.S. is certainly sort of best in class in that regard and, and uh, probably the most demanding international player in terms of security for its athletes and, and citizens. Uh, to answer your first question, I think, you know, absent an actual attack, uh, what would uh, be disruptive to U.S. participation in the Olympics? You know, the, the, the only thing I can imagine is if there were a, a very serious, credible set of threats directed at U.S. athletes or at venues that U.S. athletes would, would be attending. Uh, combined with a sense that the Russians aren't sharing enough information about what's being done to counter it and a sense that we have an inability to counter it ourselves. And so if there's a real sense of serious risk to our athletes uh, that is imminent, that is a material, uh, and that can't be countered, then you would start to see a discussion uh, in the situation room around what is to be done. Uh, but that kind of a decision is taken incredibly seriously. Nobody wants to see the Olympics disrupted. Um, pulling the American athletes out would be, you know, disastrous uh, for everybody, I think, uh, and would give the terrorists a victory. And so you would want to take that decision very carefully and only in the most serious of, of situations. With that, I'd, <coughs> excuse me, with that, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming out this morning. This briefing will be archived at CSIS.org. Um, you can uh, follow our Twitter feed at, at CSIS uh, for updates, and we will have a transcript out later, which we'll release on Twitter at CSIS and uh, on our homepage, uh, www.csis.org. Uh, thanks very much for coming this morning.